welcome to episode six of Abbott and Costello Meet the Podcast, Keep Them Flying. I'm Jerry Shario, and I'm here to introduce our host, actor, director, author, playwright, composer, an award-winning actor once said he really likes this guy, Nick Santamaria. <laughs> Hello there. <laughs> I'm getting to love your introduction. To <laughs> it reminds me of the Jack Benny program when Don would introduce him with some wise-ass remark. And, yes. And like, oh, Don, that wasn't funny, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we have our own version of it. Thank yeah. you, Jerry. I appreciate it. And as usual, it's always a pleasure to see you and to uh, foist upon the, uh, the unsuspecting public our <laughs> our views on a comedy team that died 50 years ago. You or know, as- by episode six, if they're still listening, they're not unsuspecting anymore, I would hope. <laughs> Well, wait, just hang around, you guys, because uh, today is Kevin Brownlow's birthday. And Kevin Brownlow, God bless him, has been helping me find these clips, these rare clips from the Bud Abbott Variety Show, uh, the show he did after Lou passed away. It was never really shown. It was never really broadcast. But we have these clips and we have one today that is going to absolutely slay you. So just hang around and we'll wait. Uh, Kevin is actually faxing it to me during this uh, broadcast, and uh, I will play it when we get to it. But in the meantime, Jerry, we are talking about a film that is completely discombobulated once again. Uh, Yes. if If you listen to our last podcast, we talked about the movie Hold That Ghost, which was filmed as their second starring film, but was released as their third starring film. They rushed the production of In the Navy to open before Hold That Ghost because Buck Privates was so successful. They had the Andrew sisters back and all of that. So we have Hold That Ghost. It's a huge hit. Everybody loves it. Lou Costello has claimed the uh, the funniest scare take ever. Mel Brooks still says that. He still says Lou Costello yeah. had the best scare take. And he's right. So the next movie... They're sitting around, uh, the writers, uh, they're saying, what are we going to do with these boys? And uh, they come up with another common trope amongst uh, comedians in those days. How about a comedy Western? Now, being Abbott and Costello, the Western was going to take place in modern day. It was going to be a modern day dude ranch, right? With some of the Western cliches. Uh, presenting themselves along the way. It's really uh, a great way to present Abbott and Costello in that atmosphere. Although I will say the Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap made six years later was not only a great Abbott and Costello movie, but it's really a great Western. Uh, Yes, it is. Right? It was originally written for Jimmy Stewart. Did you know that? I did not know that. Think about that. Think about the idea where he has to take care of the widow and the kids and blah, blah, blah. Jimmy Stewart. Well, you know, Marjorie Maine. She, well, she's my main gal. She's my main girl. Um, but what is it, Mary? I want the moon. Um, so, we're, Jimmy, get out of here. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, uh, we're talking about now, this is amazing when you think about it. Uh, I go back and I say, okay, they're made this Western. Arthur Lubin still directing them on, on a, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he's, he's got a grand slam. He's doing great. So, he films this Western. And then he gets he gets a note from the front office saying, "Stop the western, <laughs> or uh, you know we'll we'll get back to it. We yeah. have to make another service comedy." Now, what happened? The Army Air Force made an announcement that during the fall of 1941 they were going to have a big, big, big drive to get people to join that area of the service. Now, remember, this movie was released almost a week before. Pearl Harbor. So this is getting really serious at this time. The trailer for this film was almost a two-reeler. It was a a recruitment advertisement mixed in with some of Abbott and Costello's scenes. Yes. Uh, So this was big doings, yeah. This was like something they felt they had to do. So they switched it around, and Arthur Lubin, God bless him, he comes back and they get the script, a script that was originally called Flying Cadets. And it was originally written for Freddie Bartholomew and Jackie Cooper. 
Oh, that great comedy team of Freddie Bartholomew and Jackie Cooper. Yes, I remember them well. Oh, yes, I love all their routine. Um, but, <laughs> can you imagine? Freddie Bartholomew? Wow. I say, this is wonderful. I love to go up in the sky. <laughs> and, and Jackie's still got his lower lip down. You know, people are tripping on him. Um, but anyway, so yeah, that was their original intent. These two child actors who were at a very awkward stage uh, were going to make this movie for Universal Studios. And both were with MGM during their glory days. So this was mm -hmm. sort of a come down for them. And they didn't quite know what to do with them. So anyway, they decide to get two of their best writers comedy writers, True Boardman and, ready, Nat Perrin, our Marx yes. Brother friend. Yes, our Marx Brother connection. Uh, oh. and, of, and of course, the great John Grant to throw mm -hmm. in the routines that I love so much in this film. So anyway, they were given 12 days in Ontario, California, a beautiful area of California, north mm -hmm. of Los Angeles. And they're at Cal Arrow, the airport or air place, uh, that's where the training was going on for the Army Air Force. So they had 12 days to film there on location. And, it, you know, it makes all the difference. Don't you think, Jerry? It's like it's it so really authentic. does. I mean, the, the feel and the, the flavor of the film from that location just mm -hmm. adds so much to it. it it's absolutely it's, you know that they're actually out there on an air, a tarmac in front of actual air, you know, it's not right. a rear projection. It's not a painted backdrop or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. The interiors, of course, universal. Yeah. Um, but but the exteriors are really, you know, if you're a, a, a World War II buff, uh, it would be interesting to watch this film, if only for that. To see, yes. uh, and I loved, I wanted to get to this a little later, but the recruits, you know, they used as extras, some yes. of the recruits, the laughing. When, when Bud and Lou walk into the sprinklers and Lou loses his pants and the whole bit, you hear the laughter, you know, it's so funny. And I loved, I just love watching their faces, watch them, yeah. you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> so anyway, Ride 'em Cowboy, which is the cowboy movie that's pushed aside and to its detriment, I might say, because it's, it's kind of a mess. <laughs> we'll get mm. to that next week, but yeah. Uh, so what they did was they filmed this film and released it ahead of uh, Ride em Cowboy. And again, it was huge. This is their fourth film in 10 months. Fourth starring film. This is actually their mm -hmm. fifth film <laughs> since 1940. And it's only 1941. <sighs> the audience could not. Get they couldn't get enough. They just couldn't get enough yeah. of these guys. They were the perfect team at the perfect time. Let's just put it that way. Okay. The movie begins. I, I don't know about you, Jerry, but um, I'm the type of person that whistles or hums or even sings my favorite movie songs, songs that no one in a million years would be singing at the same time I am singing them. And one of them yep. is spread your wings, you eagles and fly. The theme to keep them flying. So, yeah, that song just stays in my head. But so does Ride 'em Cowboy. Ride them, cowboy, ride. We stand together side by side. I'm a sick man. I'm a very sick man. Can I just... <laughs> <laughs> I just want to... I want to take a side alley at this point. I just want to say something that I thought of as I was watching this movie last night. You yes. know, a lot of people just don't like old movies, period. Mm -hmm. They won't watch a black and white movie. They think uh, a lot of the movies are contrived. They think the acting is bad. Whatever it is, they just don't have the capacity to accept an older film. And as I'm watching Keep Them Flying last night, I thought to myself, this is very plot heavy. This has a very heavy plot. Mm -hmm. This poor guy, you know, can't uh, solo because he watched his father crash and die. <laughs> so he has a phobia yeah. and there's this hotshot guy who wants to help him and everybody's, you know, it's, it's supposed to be a comedy. And of course, you know, when Abbott and Costello come in, it is quite the comedy, but I could see why I get weird reactions when I mention that I really love their film work more than anything else about them mm. because I love old movies. I love the plot of Keep Them Flying. I do. I get involved with it. I care about Dick Ferran and William Gargan and Carol Bruce. I'm sorry. It's it's part of the movie. I love the mm -hmm. songs. I love the songs. Whereas most people would go make a sandwich 
during the song, I'm there going, boy, that's really beautiful. Boy, I, I, yeah. I wonder if I could figure that out on my ukulele, you know, things like that. But I guess, you know, different people, different strokes for different folks. But mm -hmm. this is the main reason why people prefer the television show. Just it's the same theory I have about the Three Stooges being the most revered comedians from that day. It's because everything was so short and sweet for a new attention span. Yeah. That's really what it is. And that's what the Abbott and Costello show is, too. It's Abbott yeah. and Costello routines without all the, you know, the fat, you might call it. But I like the fat. <laughs> Sorry. I'm a chubby chaser when it comes to movies. <laughs> <laughs> I get emotional. Get it? Ooh. That's not bad. Um, anyway, so. Uh, well, that's I mean, your opinion, but yeah. <laughs> We don't want to get to get into those. So, uh, yeah, Jared, any uh, any thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I, I have to admit, I tend to side more with that camp mm -hmm. saying I want to see Abbott and Costello in an Abbott and Costello movie. Yes. I love the Andrews sisters in this one. Um, most of the songs. Yes, I enjoy a lot. Martha Ray, especially. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I just love Martha great. Ray anyway. Me but too. her songs as well. And so I can... Um, somewhat side with both camps in this well, no, I get and especially you. being a musical theater guy yeah as you are mm -hmm. so yeah i i understand the value and appreciate the the good music yeah I, it's a personal choice like i say and you're either you're either into that kind of thing or you're not and yeah. that's why I would get so nervous when I was a little boy and I'd invite one of you know one or a couple of my friends over to watch a movie and they wouldn't stop talking you know, because it's like, oh, this is boring. This is boring. I, I'm, I'm a weird guy. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say something about the plot. I don't know. I, I, I don't mind it. I really don't mind it. I love the song, uh, The Boy with the Wistful Eyes. I think it's a gorgeous song. Mm -hmm. I love Bigfoot Pete, the Boogie Woogie Man. Right? Oh, Those, yeah. The solo that Martha Ray does, nominated yep. for an Oscar that year. Yes. Lost to... The last time I saw Paris, my heart was young and gay. <laughs> you know, singing over a dish full of snails. But um, <laughs> but actually, uh, Pigfoot Pete should have won. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, their fourth release in uh, 10 months. The critics, by the way, this is a film that the critics absolutely raved about. Yeah. Not so much the plot but the boys and especially Martha Ray working with the boys. The New York Morning Telegraph critic said that yes. the scenes between Lou and Martha Ray were the funniest on film since Chaplin. So you have an wow. idea, you know, of just how appreciated they were, even by the critics. But yep. it was Universal's uh, insistence on um, really overexposing them and grabbing every last dime that made them less so, made the critics yeah. start saying, hey, enough, you know, <laughs> let's start parsing it out a little bit, a little more uh, carefully. Well, isn't it about this time, the way I heard the story, it was attributed to uh, Milton Berle saying mm -hmm. things are slow in Hollywood, Abbott and Costello haven't made a picture all day. <laughs> yes. Actually, if you go back to the first episode of our podcast, I used that joke with Matthew Conium writing a book. He hasn't written a book all day. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but it was on yes. the Milton Girl radio show that he said that. And I'm sure he was very jealous because his movies were not doing well <laughs> at no. all. No. 20th Century Fox starred him in a, I guess they were like copies of the Red Skelton you know, Fox pictures, the uh, whistling in Brooklyn, whistling yeah. in the dark. So Burl's, they're very tough to get through. I tried a few weeks ago. It's not easy. So anyway, okay, getting back to our movie, uh, written by great people, Marx Brother mm -hmm. people. And the boys are, once again, almost relegated to comedy relief in this one. Don't you think, Jar? Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of like, you know, yes. plot, 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 bring in a routine, Plot, plot, plot. Oh, look, there's Abbott and Costello in the background watching. And then you cut to them and they yep. do their thing. Yeah, because the plot is kind well, of... Well, yeah, because they, they're brought in as, you know, the the, the best friends of That's Dick Ferran. You're the best friends of the hero. And they're so they get that... Yeah. 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what they are, kind of, you know? And this is another yeah. one where Bud is great when he's on. But then he often, as Bud often does, I, I'm going to go do something over here, you know, and leave Lou to do the routine, with, you know, to do all the grunt work. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, okay. The movie opens. Uh, in fact, I have to say that my favorite, other than the, uh, the uh, I don't care for nothing routine, my mm -hmm. favorite sequence is this whole carnival sequence at the beginning with William Davidson. Yes. Uh, oh, and he was worth his weight in gold. He's he was Moose Matson in uh, Hold That Ghost. Mm -hmm. um, and he, in here, he's the foil to uh, not only Bud and Lou, but to Dick Ferran as well. Dick Ferran is a stunt flyer. He goes to he's a barnstormer. He goes to carnivals and he does stunts in his plane and blah, blah, blah. But we find out that he's got four women waiting for him to land uh, women that he <laughs> he made some promises to that he wasn't ready to keep <laughs> yeah. so yeah, i don't know how else to put it and one of them is susan, <laughs> one of them is susan miller who played squidulum with wc fields just a little bit before this in never give a sucker an even break squidge remember uh, yes. <laughs> and she has that one line so waiting for dick foran to land but anyway, so uh, Dick Ferran is uh, the bane of the carnival owner's existence. Uh, that's William Davidson. William Davidson, by the way, was a football star for Columbia and mm. became a lawyer before his acting days. He was a working lawyer and did not uh, get into film acting until later in life. Of course, he didn't have much later in life because he died Six years after this film, he was like 59 mm. years old and he had a heart attack. But he was always one of my favorite comic foils. He was always good, even yep. in serious parts. He was just wonderful. Uh, and he's great with the boys. He's just great with the boys. Uh, Bud is introduced uh, as a uh, huckster, as a, a roustabout, introducing the fun house, you know. And you could picture yeah. Bud doing that as a kid, you know, when he hung around Coney Island. And then Lou's entrance is one of my favorites. That guy's always getting under my feet. And of course, he's, he comes down in a slide and knocks uh, William Davidson off his feet. Um, <laughs> and when they start yelling at each other, I love when Lou says, oh, poison ivy. Now you made me say something rash. Uh, <laughs> yes. I could have sworn I said it. So, yeah, that was uh, that was fun. I do want to point out, especially talking about Lou's uh, entrance in this film, up till now, this is probably his most physical film. He has taken yeah. falls and hits and just right, left, and center. Yeah. And mm -hmm. doing them beautifully as he does. Yes. But, yes. but yeah. He's still, got that, <laughs> he's still got that youthful, that youthful energy, you know? Yeah. Childlike energy almost. But yeah, he's mm -hmm. he's all over the place in this one. Uh, <laughs> but what about the, the Kill the Umpire scene? Uh, yes. Or the Umpire Strikes Back. There's a one part that just, it makes me laugh every single time, and that's the protector. Wait a minute, here, come here, now, wait a minute, listen, I'm going home, I forgot something. What would you forget? I forgot to stay there. Well, all right, here, I'll straighten that out. Come here, here, there's a protector, put that on. There you are. See, now when the ball hits the protector, it bounces off. This is a protector? Certainly. And the ball bounces off the protector? Well, certainly. Did you ever stop to figure out what makes the little ball bounce off the protector? What? My head! Yep. So, yeah, so Lou is put in that position where, and what I love is every time the bat hits his head, it sounds like it's hitting wood. <laughs> I think it's a great touch. Yes. It's, it's a right. slight, slight flavor of the Three Stooges there, but yeah. That's what it is. You know what? Universal was no was no uh, piker when it came to great sound effects. And just watch yeah. a W.C. Fields movie. They're all over W.C. Fields. Yes. <laughs> uh, with the... Um, the close-up of Franklin Pangborn when he gets sick. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh, that was the sound it made. Anyway, uh, getting back to our film. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. So the boys are fired. They're fired. William Davidson can't take it anymore. And uh, off they go. They end up at the Club Manila that night. I, I found it interesting that they were all fired. And what do they do? They all go out on a big night, spending night at a fancy nightclub. That's what I call chutzpah. Let me wipe this. <laughs> Let me get a rag. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, it's okay. I use the National Enquirer. Um, 
<laughs> so, okay. The boys are fired. They end up in a nightclub and they decide to form a union. Well, first of all, I have to say there's, there's a scene in, in the movie where they actually walk into the nightclub and Lou is holding on to the back of the jacket of Dick Ferran like a four-year-old. And it just, yes! it, you just, I, I love it. I just, it's a yes! endear. <laughs> These are the kinds of things that made me fall in love with Lou Costello. <laughs> it's just a little touch like that. Yep. Um, and then he does that wonderful fall down the stairs. Uh, so anyway, they decide that no more women. That's what gets them into trouble with Dick Ferran. They're going to start the, um, it's kind of like the uh, Little Rascals. The What is it? The Female the he, Woman Haters Club? The He-Man Woman Haters the Club. He-Man Woman Haters Club. They form their own version of it. And because Lou has $30 of his own, he becomes the treasurer. Of course. Uh, <laughs> and this introduces us to the lovely, and boy, I was watching her last night on Blu-ray, and Carol Bruce was one elegant lady. That is mm. one beautiful lady. I had a slight connection to her in that uh, I did a play with Carol Cook's husband, Tom Troop, and we became good buddies. This was a Florida production. When we got back to Los Angeles, uh, he invited me over. We hung out, blah, blah, blah. They told me that Carol Bruce was one of their best friends. She was still alive at this time. And of course, I wanted to say, please introduce me. But she was working on sitcoms into the 1990s, you know, into, into the early 2000s, actually, and passed away not too long ago. Mm. So uh, she was around and, and quite a pro. And she sings. This is a real American songbook hit. You know, this is a number that when you go through the songs of the 1940s, because it was the theme song of Tommy Dorsey, the great jazz trombonist, mm -hmm. um, she sings, I'm getting sentimental over you. Beautifully, I might add. And uh, yes. it's, it's actually quite a famous number, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad they included it in this because it's, it's certainly welcome. Uh, but mm -hmm. Dick Ferran suddenly forgets his union ties and, <laughs> and makes a beeline right for Miss Bruce. And uh, she's not amenable towards him because he's quite the uh, braggart. That's his character in the movie. That's his function. He is the hotshot pilot. Uh, I can get any woman I want and I can do anything in an airplane. And uh, I'm Dick Ferran and I'm probably wearing a girdle. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I happen to be a, a, a Dick Ferran fan, which rhymes. He's a yeah. cowboy from Jersey. And not just that, mm -hmm. but he's also a songwriter. Nobody knows that. I once bought a music book of all oh. his songs, and it, they were all Western-themed songs, and uh, quite good, actually. Uh, talented guy. Very talented. Wow. I love him as a leading man. I don't know about you, but I think he, he's terrific. Oh, yeah. He, yeah. You know? He really is. He's strong, and he's a good yeah. cowboy lead, too. Mm -hmm. um, getting ahead of myself here. We're in the nightclub. They're all going to join up now. Actually, Dick is just going to join up. Bud and Lou are going to go along for the ride and hopefully be his ground crew, which really doesn't exist in the Army Air Force. <laughs> uh, so, there's some wonderful stuff, though, when they arrive at the uh, at the field, which is Cal Aero in Ontario, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole thing about going to the USO, right? Yeah. Or as Lou says, the USO. Uh, as they're talking, I'm starting to look around, and there's Norman Abbott, Bud's nephew, coming out the door as they're talking, and then later, he's coming back in. <laughs> so it was like, Norman, come here. You know, that kind of thing. He's also sitting at the counter when they're doing I don't care for nothing. So he's everywhere. Norman's everywhere. Norman, is that you? Ooh. So, ooh, boy, talk about a reference. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember the Red Fox movie of that? Oh, yeah. I remember. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think uh, Norman Lear was involved in that. Or maybe Bud Yorkin. One of them. One uh, of them, so yeah. Yeah, one of them. It was it was one of those pros, but the movie really didn't work. Okay, so Norman Abbott is walking out of the thing, and Lou does one of my favorite things. He walks up to some guys playing pool, and he says, oh, tennis. And, of course, the guy hits him <laughs> in the stomach with the back of the cue as he's going to make his shot. Now, there was supposed to be a routine here, uh, not unlike the dice game and the, what's the one? Oh, the one coming up in Ride Him Cowboy, the poker game. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, but that it was cut. It didn't. It didn't make it. Mm. Uh, I guess it was too close to the routine that was coming up, right? Ah, yeah, that's what I thought. There are actually two scenes cut from this movie 
that would have helped. One was the Magic Act, where uh, the the tin silver, you know, they were yep. doing a USO show and they do the Magic Act. It would have really played here. Oh uh, yeah. But they saved it for uh, Lost in a Harem at mm-hmm. MGM. They did it in a, a couple of years later. And they also did a scene uh, at a roller rink, which they later revised and hit the ice as an ice, ah. ice roller rink. Yeah, Lou doing the crack the whip and all that. Yeah, yeah. So they saved it. They were very uh, economical. They didn't throw anything away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, far from it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> that worked. Let's do it again. <laughs> uh, did we do it on the TV show? No, we did it on radio. Well, let's do it on the TV show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I often wondered about that. This leads to, to me, the center of the movie. This is it. If only this routine came from this movie, it would be a favorite of mine. This is, I call it, I don't care for nothing. Some people yes. call it a cup of coffee and a turkey sandwich. Uh, some people call it, uh, go ahead and order something. Yep. Uh, but it's basically a reworking of a Laurel and Hardy bit, which was probably yes. a bit even before them in the movie Men of War. Yes. Only they had a great punchline to theirs. And I'm talking about when they don't have enough money to buy sodas for the two girls and the two of them, Ollie says, I'll buy one and I'll give you half. So when James Finlayson asks you what you want, you just say, you don't care for anything. And of course, Stan keeps... The reason I like Abbott and Costello's better is because Stan just keeps saying immediately, soda... What did he just tell you? You know what I mean? Yes. It's a little irritating, actually. But the ending is so wonderful that you kind of forgive that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Ollie gives him the whole glass and says, here, you drink your half. And he drinks the entire thing. And Ollie, looking at the glass and then at us, of course, and mm-hmm. then back at Stanley, he says, why did you drink the whole thing? And Stan says, well, my half was on the bottom. It's a great <laughs> punch." It is. It really is. And in my opinion, the Abbott and Costello version, their take on the routine, I love it, but it doesn't have a punch. It doesn't have an end, really. It just stops. It it goes into the next. Actually, I was watching this last night and I wanted to to talk about this with you. It can't have that. I mean, unless he ate the whole sandwich, you know what I mean? The the line wouldn't work. Uh, it works with soda. It works with a glass of liquid. Mm-hmm. But my point is, I kind of gave them a pass this time because it led right into another routine. Mm-hmm. Um, it led into the piece of cake. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like, yes. okay, so let's explain. Bud has a quarter. Uh, they can't order for both of them uh, on that money. So Bud says, I'll order a turkey sandwich and a cup of coffee and I'll give you half. So Lou says, that's great. But he says, if she asks you if you want anything, you say you don't care for anything. No, I don't care for nothing. That's right. I don't want. All right. So they get up there and Bud says, I'll have a turkey sandwich and a cup of coffee. And she and Martha Ray, God bless her, turns and says, And what do you have? I don't care for nothing. Oh, sure you do. Now stop bashing me. I don't care for nothing. That's why I'm not in the mood you to eat. You told me that you were hungry. I know. I told you a lot of things. But I ain't going to eat. That's why. Well, are you hungry? I beg your pardon, miss, but I'm not hungry. You are hungry. Now look, you're in a restaurant. What do people go to a restaurant for? Not me. I'm just what in here. What do people go to a restaurant for? Sometimes I wonder. They go there to eat. Yeah, eat. That's what you're here That's for. That's a wonderful word, eat. Well, all right, order something. I'm not hungry. Now listen, you want people to think I'm a cheapskate around here? Well, go on, order something. Order something small. Give me a small steak. But I just, but I just get through telling you, huh? But it doesn't have that punchline that Laura yeah. and Hardy had. But it does lead into, we failed to mention, Martha Ray plays twins. So there's two Martha Rays. You know, there's Gloria and, well, I forget, what's the other Barbara. One? Barbara, Barbara and Gloria. And first of all, the the special effects are by John Fulton, who did the original Invisible Man and all of the sequels, went on to work on some of the greatest films ever made. I can't believe the work, uh, the mat work of uh, having the two of them in the same scene, but Mm -hmm. they cross over into each other's, like Martha Ray will extend her hand and it'll go into the other Martha Ray, you know, onto yeah. the, to that scene. It's really beautiful work, gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Even the editing during their uh, entrances and exits and through the yes. swinging doors. <laughs> Bud and Lou ruin one take by talking too much and they, they get cut off. But otherwise, Martha is just incredible. She plays two very disparate characters. One is very proper and very nice. 
And the other one is like Lou. The other one is just, hey, how you doing? You know, it's typical Martha Ray. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, of course, the uh, more coarse one falls falls for Lou. And the other one falls for Bud. Yeah. How nice. Yeah. He gets <laughs> Bud, a girl. Yeah. Bud gets a girl. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that just cute little Lou? Bud gets a girl. So anyway, that's kind of nice, which I, I like that. But this whole cake routine starts. The one that likes Lou gives him a piece of cake. Say, Here, you can have this for free. Oh, she gave me the cake for nothing. Doesn't mean we're engaged, does it? Uh, <laughs> and then when she goes, yeah, you're kind of cute. She makes that sound with her teeth. <laughs> and she walks away and Lou, <laughs> Lou turns to Bud and says, what is that? What, what, what? And Bud goes, you know, she's, she's uh, like that. And he goes, oh, must be a horsewoman. <laughs> she must ride horses. <laughs> <laughs> So he keeps eating the cake or going to eat the cake and the wrong girl comes out and says, what are you doing with that cake? I didn't give you that cake. <laughs> and this is where I have to say there are more laughs than that one punchline that Laurel and Hardy have. Yes. By ending this scene with the cake, it really it's more laughter. And there is a punchline when she finally comes out and says, OK, let's go. And, you know, Lou can't believe it. She keeps changing her mind. Who is, yeah. is this thing crazy? You know, one minute she likes Bud, one minute she likes him. So anyway, it works out. It, it works out. Well, yes, I will. I will grant you the fact that yes, the the addition of the cake at the end that does give it a bit of closure. In fact, speaking of their penchant for reusing material, this routine shows up on the TV show, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I can't think of the actress's name who plays the two. Joan Shawley. Thank you, Joan mm -hmm. Shawley, and she's good. Everything I've ever seen her in, she's very good. She pales in comparison, however, to Martha Ray. I agree. I Martha agree. just does such a good job in this that, that um, the TV version of this routine just kind of eh, doesn't quite make it, I agree. in my opinion. No, 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 I do. I agree with you. Uh, they, I think they do a version of it with, um, believe it or not, Bruce Cabot, the actor. <laughs> and they do it on the live show, but they cut out the twin thing. They just do the okay. I don't care for nothing. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, and it, again, it doesn't really work. You know, yeah. Bruce Cabot is fun and everything, but he was probably drunk at the time. And <laughs> he, was only, he was only there because Errol Flynn was on the same show and they were best buds, yeah. you know, until <laughs> Errol Flynn went to England and put every penny he had into a movie called William Tell. You know, the story of William Tell mm -hmm. with the apple and all that. And uh, he brought over Bruce Cabot actually who was not working and needed the money and uh bruce cabot ended up looking at the production thought it was ridiculous and left him high and dry <laughs> he's one of his best friends they never spoke again wow yeah yeah how about that wow That's a little sidelight uh yeah so they get sneaked in to the administration building so they can find their friend jinx mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> who makes a very oh i wanted to mention one other thing every one of their military comedies from Buck Privates to In the Navy and now Keep Them Flying has an introductory speech by an upper, you know, echelon uh, officer. Yes. I wanted to put them all together. You know what I mean? Just make a whole <laughs> real boring speech <laughs> and maybe cut away to people like babies yawning or, or dogs <laughs> yawning or whatever. This is so boring. <laughs> Just remember to keep them flying. But this was the mood of the day. You know, I'm mm -hmm. sure this movie got a lot of people to join up. They yeah. thought, yeah, we can meet Martha Ray. Um, <laughs> so there they are, and they're in the administration office. Now, this is important. Yes. Dick Ferran is already there, and he's getting uh, admonished because he made a very grandstand uh, approach in his plane, you know, while they were doing the boring speech. And uh, so he's getting yelled at already. But Heathcliff and Blackie walk in. Heathcliff and Blackie. Bud was Blackie and <laughs> Lou is Heathcliff, which is a, a uh, joke about Wuthering Heights, which was a big hit a couple of years back. Um, <laughs> romantic Heathcliff. Yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, Lou does his very first dramatic scene in a movie. Yes. And he does some later on in his career, but this is the very first. And yes. this is a, a speech that when I was a child, when I was a chubby child uh, sitting there wondering why I wasn't good at sports, I used to cry when I'd hear him say this speech. Mm. And I mean, I was very young, of course, and very yeah. sensitive. 
Well, there must be something around here that we can do. Sure, Major. There's thousands and thousands of guys like Blackie and I that want to do something to serve the country. We can't help it if we got flat feet or we've got poor eyesight. Maybe we haven't got training, but we're willing to try. Honestly, we will try hard to. It all don't mean nothing if you don't give us this chance. After all, our hearts are in the right places. I understand all that. Look, but, uh, Major, when I was a little bit of a kid, I was too fat to play on a baseball team, so they made me the bat boy. And then when the football season came around, I, was, I couldn't run fast enough to make the football team, so, so they made me the water boy. And now, Major, when you're training the biggest team that we ever had, there surely must be a place for Blackie and I. Maybe it's a water boy or a bat boy. Won't you, Major, give us a chance? Please, Major. And he does a great job. He really does a great job. You see mm -hmm. what is there. You oh, definitely yeah. see what's there. And his exit made me laugh. I had to pause it, actually, because I was laughing into the next scene. He turns around. He's a great guy, Jinx. He's a great guy. He turns around and walks right into the wall. <laughs> he recovers, turns around, and Bud slams the door in his face. So he's got two bumps in the face before he makes his exit and it's just lou costello times 10. it's just one yep oh yeah oh yeah <laughs> okay so now we're introduced to our plot the plot uh and you can't spell uh plots without plot i don't know what that means but so jinx roberts is dick Ferran. he's our leading man he's the showboater the one who does all the stunt flying and blah 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 he's not legitimate he's not a legitimate pilot but we find out that he once was. And his new instructor is William Gargan, who is the person who had to turn him in when he made a bad decision when they were commercial pilots. Mm -hmm. And the grudge was there the, you know, for years and years and years. And now they're meeting up. And who is his teacher? The guy who's supposedly teaching him to fly is his mortal enemy. So that's the plot here. And then there's yeah. the added addition of the younger guy who saw his father get killed in a landing and has trouble soloing. He's, he's got a psychological problems. And he's the brother of Carol Bruce, who happens to be there as well, just like the Andrew sisters were there in Buck Privates, mm -hmm. <laughs> coincidentally, and, you know, yep. and all of that. So uh, that's our plot. That's what's going on. And it's not a bad one. It's really not no. a bad story. Now, purposely, the writers were told to make this a little more serious because of the uh, impending war that supposedly some people knew about before we did. Mm. I mean, that's just conspiracy theory, but still, it, it was there. It was there. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think too many people were surprised that we eventually got into the war. Certainly not my cousin Dave. So anyway, the... Um... <laughs> <laughs> I thought oh, I threw okay. <laughs> I thought I'd throw that in, yeah. uh, considering I threw Dave in the well when he was young. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'm back for my flight of fancy. No pun intended. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sure it was. No, it really wasn't. I just <laughs> aware. Okay, so they do their big, uh, I don't care for nothing. They uh, are allowed to join the ground crew. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, they start with the mix-ups. They tell them to taxi the plane and Lou starts yelling for a taxi, you know, <laughs> to help mm -hmm. out. Uh, and eventually Bud rolls it onto his foot, an entire plane onto his foot <laughs> and then can't understand why Lou is in pain. Uh, <laughs> typical Abbott Augusta. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, okay. They wanted to start the plane. Lou yells contact and Bud won't play to him. And he's just, come on, yell contact, say contact. He does it later in whodunit when he turns on the blender. He says, contact. <laughs> and he turns on the blender. To this day, every time I use the blender, I have to say <laughs> contact. <laughs> which is weird because sometimes i would say it and people would show up with allergy medicine for some reason uh, um, yes. so anyway uh <laughs> alert jerk um okay so we're doing that and then you know what pigfoot pete the boogie woogie man comes up this is yes. the i'm holding up my uh quotation marks this is the andrew sisters number uh, since yes. they didn't have the Andrew sister, they were starring in their own films at this point. I tried to watch one the other day, by the way, and um, I would say showing it to people in a theater would uh, generate a lot of laughter, if only for their acting, their bad Ooh. acting. Oh, they're terrible. They're just yeah. 
And it's, it's very funny because they tried to turn a singing act into an acting act. And mm-hmm. Patty was the, really the only one who had chops for that. Yeah. But even her chops weren't, weren't deep enough to make it stick. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, so we get Martha Ray, which to me is like a, a bonus, you know, because mm-hmm. she, she not only can sing and dance like, like them, but she can uh, comed uh, with the best of them. She's, oh, yeah. She was almost lose equal, I would imagine, at that point. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe his equal. Well, yeah, and she, uh, she held her own against men like Chaplin. And even, uh, you know, later in her career, uh, there was a, a TV special where she's up there against the Three Stooges. Oh, I remember that and one. Holding her own. <laughs> she was great. I remember she hit Mo really hard yeah. at one point. Yeah. Mo looked at her like, whoa, who are you hitting? <laughs> <laughs> that was a Danny Thomas special, I believe. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And she also uh, uh, early films with Bob Hope at Paramount. Yep. So she worked with some of the best film comedians and, and actually the best uh, in 1947 in Monsieur Verdoux. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Chaplin, my God, talk about generous. He let her run away with those scenes. They yes. Were, I, I, you got to be impressed by that. That was that really is something. Uh, and she talked about it to the end of her life. She, I think that was her badge of pride for the rest of her life. Chaplin liked me. Yeah. Uh, and think about something Lou. to be proud of. Yeah. Think about Lou. Lou had probably just read that Chaplin thought he was the funniest comedian working in films today. Yeah. So he had that same badge and here, there they were working together. <laughs> um, so Pigfoot Pete, the boogie woogie man. I mean, it sounds a little bit like this. We're out in Kansas City on one, two street. They say that there's a guy they call Bigfoot Pete. He plays piano by ear. Turn he plays all night for pigs, feet, and beer. He's murder on the 88. He's the guy that brought the boogie woogie up to date. He's got a cannon in his left hand and a rifle in his right. He's just a double barrel. Uh, that just makes me want to, you know, boogie my woogie. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to get dirty or anything, but, you know. Ooh, you do, fun. and you're going to clean it up. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> oh, everyone's a censor. Oh, this reminds me. Uh, today is uh, Kevin Brownlow's birthday, and he did come up with the final clip from the Bud Abbott Variety Show. This is the show Bud Abbott did after Lou passed away. Uh, Their manager, Eddie Sherman, thought it would be a great idea for Bud to host his own variety show. And we played a few clips up to this point. Yes. They're very brief. Very brief clips. This was the best thing about them. Yeah. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, (laughs) um, So, yeah, no, no. You know, it's funny, Jerry, that that a lot of people tune in just for this. this, Um, so here we go. Uh, this is actually Bud's last uh, variety show. Uh, and something happened, and, and it just changed everything. Here we okay. go with the Bud Abbott Variety Show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Bud Abbott Variety Show, starring everybody's favorite straight man, Bud Abbott. And here he is, the star of our show, Bud Abbott. Yay! Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. A little later, we're going to do a little magic with some tin, I mean, silver tubes and a little bottle. All right. But first, I'd like to introduce my first guest. This is an amazing man. He's made 190 shorts over at Columbia Studios with his two partners. Please welcome Mo Howard. Yay! Yay! Hiya, Mo. Put it there. Quiet, bud. What are you talking about? Get out of here, gray pen. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mo, you're not quiet. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm going to give you two. Oh, oh, my eyes. <laughs> cut it. Cut it. Cut it. And that's all we have. Uh, and that was all. <laughs> bud never went back. <laughs> I can't blame him. Oh. They, did, they did offer Mo the show afterwards, but he demurred. <laughs> he demurred. He just didn't want to do it. So uh, that was it. That was the end of the Bud Abbott variety show. <sighs> quite a quite a O'Henry oh. ending, wasn't it? 
Uh, <laughs> yes, extremely. It just made me say, oh, all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're well, moving on. Thank you for indulging. Please. That was, you know, thank Please. you, Kevin. Thank you. And birthday greetings to you, sir. So we're coming up to my next favorite routine, and that's the phone call. Now, oh, this is one. Yes. <laughs> I love this routine. Now, if you remember a day at the races, my Marx Brother friends, if you mm-hmm. remember a day at the races, Groucho drives Leonard Seeley crazy um, at playing Mr. Whitmore. Uh, on the telephone. Here's your Florida call, Mr. Whitmore. Uh, that whole routine, which is one of my favorite Groucho routines of all time, and one of mm-hmm. my least favorite films. Lou and Bud get William Gargan away from Carol Bruce. Yes. Uh, telling him he has a phone call. Now, this is so Dick Ferran can move in and, you know, take over with Carol Bruce. But in the meantime, uh, Bud tells him, you know, you're wanted on the phone. And Lou is in the other booth. They're right next to each other. And Gargan doesn't know that Lou is on the phone. So Lou drives him absolutely crazy. Hello? Hello? Yes? Yes, what? Uh, this is Morrison. Who? Morrison. He ain't here. He ain't around. I don't want Morrison. You don't want him? Then what are you, what are you calling a guy up for then? I'm not calling anybody. Oh, a practical joker, huh? Will you get off the line? I'm waiting for a party. Oh, a party, eh? Well, I'm sorry. I was to a party last night. I can't go again tonight. Two nights in a row is no good for me. Who is this? I won't tell you who is this until you tell me who is you. Listen. I'm Morrison. Morrison. Morrison, eh? When a guy gets here, I'll tell him you want to talk to him. Listen, you bird brain baboon. I'm trying to explain to you that this, that I'm Morrison. Look, look, look. You'll, you'll, you'll have to keep quiet and don't shout so loud. I can't hear what my party's saying. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, now, uh, listen. And it goes back and forth and back and yes. forth until William Gargan, who, by the way, uh, in the past worked with Harold Lloyd and Jimmy Durante and some of the other great comics, he is absolutely incredible. He mm-hmm. is so good in this routine. It's such a strong routine that I, I think it's it, it would be difficult not to be good uh, doing this. Yeah. Uh, and po- case in point is... Um, they do it in Noose Hangs High uh, with, um, what's his name, that wonder, Joseph Kalia as the gangster. And he's great, too. He's just great, too. You can tell that they're having the time of their lives, just, just oh, no pun intended, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just doing this material with him. You know, they're having, they're really having a lot of fun. And in turn, so are we. Yes. Uh, you know, Jerry, we, we both come from theater backgrounds. And mm-hmm. when younger people ask me uh, for advice, I always give them the same advice and that's have fun because if you have fun, they'll have fun. Yes. To me, that's the best direction you could possibly get, you know, Mm -hmm. enjoy what you're doing and then they will. Okay. So they do the phone routine, which is absolutely hilarious. And then another song, Dick Ferran wakes up in the morning and just starts singing the keep them flying theme song. As we all do. Yes. I do it. I do it every morning. Seriously, yeah. I do it every morning. I take the uh, sock out of my mouth and I <laughs> <laughs> uh, But anyway, the, the, uh, the song, <laughs> this scene, actually, I saw this uh, last time with a full house at the uh, Columbus Motion Picture Show, Moving, moving oh, Picture yeah. Show, uh, two years ago they showed it. And uh, this scene gets laughs. It gets big laughs because it's so over the top. And it's mm-hmm. so, you know, people, guys hitting each other with towels in the shower and stuff like that. All the while they're singing. Yeah. Spread the wings, you eagles, and fly. La, 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 la. And I can't even tell you the dirty lyrics I've come up with for this one. <laughs> but for, for another show. <laughs> <laughs> but it does show the camaraderie. Uh, he's the the roommate of Carol Bruce's brother, who is the yep. one who can't, you know, solo because he saw his father crash. So anyway, they they bond together, and Dick Ferran makes it a point that I am going to cure this guy's, you know, fear of soloing, and it becomes serious. But before it becomes serious, Bud and Lou do my second favorite thing in the entire film is the torpedo, the runaway torpedo. <laughs> Now, my yep. co-author for, of the annotated Abbott and Costello book, uh, Matthew Conium, says that uh, he has trouble with scenes, slapstick scenes that use rear projection rather than 
the actual stuff. Like Buster Keaton mm. would do the actual thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but they would never allow at this point in the Hollywood history, they would never allow these guys to do it themselves. No, and I, don't, I don't think they would want to do it themselves, to be honest with you. And in point of fact, Pat Costello, uh, Lou's older brother, did the long shots on the runaway torpedo. Yeah. Yeah. And interestingly, th- do you know how that was, how that got around? I mean, no. I used to watch this scene. I'm thinking, how are they controlling that thing? Yeah. There was a guy laying down inside it <sighs> with a steering wheel. And a little point of view, you know, a little slit in the front, and he was driving it around. Wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Pat was on top, you know, he fell off yep. a few times and whatever, but that was his job, you know, as stunt man. And uh, I just think it's a hilarious scene. And there, it's filled with rear projection, but the oh, yeah. guys are so funny. You know, it's like the chase scene in Coming Up is Ride'em Cowboy. That chase scene at the end with the uh, the Jeep, when they're in the Jeep, mm-hmm. that's a rare projection behind them, and they're hilarious. You know, it's yes. like, who, cares? who really cares? Anyway, Matthew, don't don't hold this against me. It's, it's all right. I mean, you have every <laughs> right to feel the way you do. But then again, you're British. Uh, so... Um, <laughs> so <laughs> This is a torpedo that they're they're moving from one place to another. And Bud tells him, just be careful with it because, you know, this could uh, get away. And then uh, he leaves Lou and Martha Ray approaches <laughs> holding, <laughs> holding a bottle of Coke. And they decide to christen the torpedo. And they both tell each other because they love each other. They both say, now close your eyes so the glass doesn't get in your eyes. And, and she says, OK, and you do it, too. And they, they close the eyes. And of course, she christens Lou's head. Um, <laughs> it's very funny. Um, and then she asks, well, is this dangerous? And he goes, well, only if you pull out this little pin. And of course, as he's saying it, he pulls out the little pin and the <laughs> torpedo takes off. Lou runs after it, ends up on top of it, and is taken for a tour of the, the entire airport. <laughs> going through restaurants, going through hangars. Go, and then he picks up Bud. Bud, Bud uh, gets yeah. on the front with Lou on the back so he could slide back to the propeller uh, so it'll hit him in the butt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thus increasing the comedy value. Oh, of uh, course. So they're driving around and all of a sudden it's heading towards a gas station mechanic, a car mechanic yeah. place, a tire used tire place. And they fall off. The torpedo hits the building. It explodes. About 40 tires go flying up and come down and engulf Lou, uh, who (laughs) climbs to the top of this tire tower and says, boy, am I tired. Just as another tire comes and hits him in the head. (laughs) And Bud, just to prove that he's Bud, calls him Herbie instead of Heathcliff. (laughs) He's got Chico Marx disease, you know? Yes, yes. <laughs> Harvey Yates, he's going to marry, what's her name? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh. So anyway, that that's my second favorite scene. Now, I'm going to talk about yeah. something that doesn't work for me in this film. Okay. And you tell me if you agree, Jerry. Okay. There are two finales when one is yes. only necessary. Okay, they go up yes. in the airplane the first time, right? Mm-hmm. And they do all the shtick on the wings and everything else. Hey, isn't this supposed to have uh, tires? You know, that whole thing. I used yeah. to have this on 8mm, by the way. And it was called... I still keep do. Yep. You do? Yes. <laughs> and it's called Keep On Flying. Yep. Yeah. Oh, God. Memories. <laughs> and so I've, I've seen this scene a million times. But then again, at the end, there is a big finale where uh, William Gargan's character gets into... Uh, um, a very precarious position. He jumps out with a a parachute during the closing ceremonies. You know, everybody's graduating. Dick Ferran is, of of course, has been washed out. He's been thrown Mm -hmm. away and he's leaving now. But he sees what's happening. When William Gargan jumps out of the plane, his parachute gets hooked to the fuselage and he's being pulled along through the air uh, and he can't get loose. And if he does get loose, he'll fall to his death. So, Dick Ferran looks up and says, I'll save him. He jumps in his plane <laughs> and he, uh, you know, goes up and it, it's kind of cool. I mean, the miniatures are really, really yes. good. Definitely. Mm-hmm. It's very well done. 
And then I love the way he cuts the the strings. He just kind of tips his propeller yes. forward, and it's and it cuts the strings, and he falls into the passenger seat. So he saves the day. But in the meantime, and you know he's fine. Carol Bruce is in love with him. Blah 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 blah. He's back in the Air Force, and he's learned his lesson. I'll never be a bad boy again. All right. <laughs> Speaking of bad boys, Bud and Lou followed him up there with another pilot and the two of them in the passenger seat. And the pilot says, I'm having engine trouble. You better bail out. Now, I love this. First, Bud jumps out and his parachute opens and he's floating down. Mm -hmm. Lou jumps out and it doesn't, he doesn't pull his string. He doesn't pull it. And he yeah. lands on top of Bud of Bud's parachute and he's walking around on top of Bud's <laughs> parachute. He looks like an eight-year-old kid in the snow he walking around on that thing. He is an eight-year-old kid. <laughs> oh my, that's why we loved him when we were kids. Uh, and Bud is like, get down from there. What are you doing? And then finally he can't hear Bud. So he takes out his pocket knife and he cuts a hole in the parachute. <laughs> And he falls down, and he and Bud are clinging to each other as they're falling to their deaths. Oh, oh, we harmonize, huh? Shut oh, up. Quick, oh, quick, oh, quick, oh, quick, oh, quick, the ring, ah, the ring. Find time to talk about marriage. The ring, the ring. Oh, oh, I don't know. And Bud pulls the ring on the parachute, and they float down safely into the arms of both Martha Rays. Yes. Uh, Bud gets his kiss from Barbara. And Gloria holds on to Lou, who was still attached to the parachute, and mm -hmm. says, oh, I was so scared for you up there. And he says, don't worry, I promise my feet will never leave the ground again. Then a propeller starts, blows the parachute, and sends Lou up again. <laughs> and when they ask, where does it got you? He points to his rear end, and the words, the end, come up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one of my all-time favorite closing credits in a movie. Yes, it's, it's very well done. done. Very well done. That, it reminds me of, we'll get to hit the ice, of course, but that's a very funny ending also. Yes. When his pants <laughs> on the train. Yes, but, but you are correct in your earlier statement. It's like there's two endings yes. to this movie. Two finales. And if only they could have figured out how to make it one. Um, exactly. Maybe exactly. building on on the other, you know, each other. Well, it would have been interesting to me, and I thought about it, it would have been more interesting to me if, never mind that whole thing where they go up the first time, but they go up with the guy to help Jinx, but mm -hmm. the guy uh, sees that there's trouble, and he turns to them and says, I'm jumping, and he jumps out and leaves them there, and then they yeah. could do all their airplane shtick, and then do the parachute yeah. stick, all in the there same There you thing. go. You so, should yeah. have written this. I, yeah, you know, maybe <laughs> if I could just get in touch with my neighbor, his name is uh, Wells, H.G. Wells. Uh, he's, he's got something about a time machine or something. Yeah, yeah. But I sure would love to, to go back and do that and sit in the room with Nat Perrin and True Boardman and John <gasps> Grant. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> That'd be great. So anyway, that's uh, really it. That's the end of uh, Keep Them Flying. The interesting thing about it to me is that this is actually the last film that the director Arthur Lupin made with the boys. Mm -hmm. And there's a large faction of Abbott and Costello fans, including Matthew Conium, uh, who believe that Arthur was their best director because he made the best films, the early films. Mm. I kind of veer more towards Charles Barton. Yep. I think he had the more difficult job. Uh, Arthur Lupin, who went on to, for some reason, he had this horse fetish. Uh, he did the Francis the Talking Mule series. Yes of films at Universal, and then he went on to Mr. Ed. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, okay. He hung with the horse. So anyway, that's Arthur Lubin. He went on to that from here. The last released Arthur Lubin film is the next one, uh, which yeah. we will be talking about next week. It's called Ride em, Cowboy. And again, just like Hold That Ghost, it was filmed before uh, Keep Em Flying. So we'll go into that story, and we'll, we'll talk about that film, a rather of their earlier films and of their Arthur Lubin films, I think it's the most disjointed and maybe my, my least favorite of that bunch. But we'll talk about mm. that. We'll talk about the reasons. And uh, there was something else I wanted to mention before we finish. Uh, right, keep them uh, flying. Right. It doesn't matter. It's over. It's done. I have nothing okay. else to say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. 
And that note, how about this one? There we go. Okay. That, I just got that out. Um, or as Jimmy Durante used to say, that note was given to me by Bing Crosby. And was he glad to get rid of it? Um <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, this is the end. I really I hate saying goodbye because I really enjoy this, Jerry. I really mm -hmm. enjoy our time together. I um, do as well. I'm so glad you do, and I hope the people listening do as well. And I wanted to say before we uh, left and before I forget, please let us know what you think of mm -hmm. our podcast. Uh, come on to Jerry's uh, Facebook page or to mine, and please. Write about it. We, we want to get it out there. And we're not quite sure how to check how well it's doing. So if you could give us some sort of a hint that way, we would love to know how we're doing. Okay? We really enjoy doing it. And next week also, get ready, because if I'm going to be a little strict about this. I think the songs in Ride em Cowboy are amazing. And I'm, I want to sample a few of them next week. Uh, yeah. Since Hits and a Miss. They are just... Oh, is it? No, no. The Mary Max. The Mary Max. Yeah, the it was Mary six Max. hits. Six hits yeah. were in Keep Them Flying. That's right. They sang background in uh, I'm looking for the boy with yeah. the wistful eyes. Do you know the swan that they were in? You know, the, uh, they're in a tunnel of love. And yeah. the boats are not boats. They're actual swans that you could sit in. And they float along. Mm -hmm. Lou stole his, brought it home, and it became a planter in his yard for the rest of the time he lived there. <laughs> I've I've seen some of the photos. There's some, some it, color yeah. color photos out there. That, those that his his house, his yard, and there it is, right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's not the only thing. He used to take. He would get the <sighs> Universal guys to take stuff home. He's like, you know what? I'm supporting the studio. <laughs> <laughs> this is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, my director brain says, well, hopefully, you know, wait till we're done with the scene before you steal anything. Um, that happened once. It happened yes. once. He brought everything. They had to bring everything back. <laughs> <laughs> but he just had that in him. He, he felt like it was his. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's Lou. Little kid. I do want to point something out here for those of you who have been paying very close attention as you're listening to this episode. Nick has made reference more than once about next week's episode. Oops. Sorry about that. Yeah. Wishful I just thing. don't want people to get their hopes up. You know? It's not, no, it's just, just, <laughs> you know what? This is where your editing comes in. You Every time I say week, you put in month. So it'll be like, you know, next month, <laughs> we're going to be yeah. talking about that. And that's coming next month. You know, like that. Yep. <laughs> It'll there be so go. natural. Okay, yeah. Jerry. <laughs> you do it too. Um, <laughs> thank you very much again for being here and uh, supporting this wonderful uh, quest of getting Bud and Lou out there to you. Yes. And, and, and if you're looking for something to read, the annotated Abbott and Costello, Nick Santamaria and Matthew Conium. It's a tome well worth taking up space in your bookcase. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, the intro by uh, John Landis, director. Yes. John Landis. Also, go to nicksantamaria.com for all things Nick Santa Maria, uh, including how to get my book. You could look at scenes from when I was the genie for Aladdin at Disney. Um, yeah. And lots of stuff. Biffle and Schuster, uh, all kinds of stuff. So go to www.nicksantamaria.com. And Jerry, do you have anything you want to plug? Just the hole in my bathtub. <laughs> oh, my goodness. We're talking about a ring again. <laughs> All right, folks, please come back and see us again or hear us again uh, next month. And we will uh, continue with this wonderful tribute to our two heroes, Bud and Lou. Take care. Be well. Stay healthy and stay safe. <laughs>